Let's go, girls, pick it up. Come on, girls, pick it up. Let's go, let's go. Welcome to another episode of Jay Leno's Garage, the car being featured today. My 1918 Stutz Bearcat. I think this is one of the sexiest cars of the uh, of the period, right around uh, right about by the end of World War II, or the teens, as they say. Uh, cars just about 100 years old, and the styling I thought was pretty cool. It's one of the few cars where the rear fender is higher than the body, and the body slopes down, giving it a kind of a rakish look to it. This would have been the equivalent to perhaps a uh, Camaro or a Mustang back in the day. It has uh, a lot of really cool features. It has the center throttle. It has the drop floor. It has an exhaust cutout. It has an outside gear shift. It has uh, the handbrakes on the outside as well. But we'll get into all of that in just a minute. If you think you've seen this car before, or rather you have, it was one of the first cars we did when I started this website. And it's a classic case of you know, it's hard to restore a car perfectly the first time. We've done this car three times. Not so much the cosmetics. The cosmetics we got right the first time. But just getting piston clearances and the transaxle. Harry Stutz uh, invented, at least in America, the transaxle. And this is one of the cars, one of the features of his cars, for better balance, having the transmission in the back. But it always popped out of gear. We had to go through the gears a couple of times. You had to make new pistons three separate times for this car. Um, there were just a lot of things that weren't right. Even where I got the car from, uh, up in Vermont, there was a guy called A.K. Miller, kind of a hermit kind of guy. And he was a Stutz guy and kind of a, a character, I guess you'd say. Um, he was a recluse. He was 94 years old. I don't think he had running water in the house. I don't think he had electricity in the house. Uh, and he fell off his roof at age 94 and died because he's working on the roof. And went into the house and they dug up the floor. He had $800,000 in gold bullion buried in the floor. He was born before uh, Social Security, so there was no record of him even being on the tax rolls or ever existing. So the most of the money disappeared. He was an interesting guy. I believe he was the first guy to, uh, if the rumor is correct, he flew a gyrocopter helicopter. He wanted to show President Roosevelt and landed on the White House lawn and was immediately arrested, which, of course, from that day forward, they instituted a flyover ban over the White House. I, 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 just so many stories about this guy. Anyway, this car was sitting in his lean-to, in his shed. Well, here's a picture of it. It was put in there in the 30s or early 40s, and it stayed that way all the way up to uh, the early 80s when I got the car. Um, consequently, it needed every single thing. But it was such a sexy car, such a cool car, I, I, uh, I, I just had to have it. Um, this and the Mercer Raceabout were the two hot sports cars, or at least American sports cars, of the early teens. They used to say there's nothing, nothing worse than a Mercer, and Mercer people would say you gotta be nuts to drive a Stutz, and they would throw rocks at each other, and well, much like Mustang and Camaro guys are today. Uh, that's pretty much the way it is. Uh, anyway, as you can see, the folding top goes under here. The spare wheel is up here. Uh, this was the first uh, car that um, Harry Stutz designed his own engine for. He always used Wisconsin Motors or somebody else's engines to build his cars because Harry Clayton Stutz was born in 1876. He died about 1930, one of 11 children, which is fairly common back in the day. And, you know, there's a whole group of these guys, much like you had the dot-com guys in the 90s, the Bill Gates and the Paul Allens and all those guys who would just seem to be natural geniuses with computers. There was a whole bunch of guys who were just natural geniuses with mechanical things. Henry Ford, Walter Chrysler, Harry Stutz. For some reason, this whole generation just seemed to percolate up and boom, come out of nowhere. Guys with no formal education at all, most of them, but they could look at something and go, mm, one ten thousandth is what it needs, and they would be 
exactly right. So it's, uh, it was an interesting period, you know. Uh, the internal combustion engine was the computer of the early 1900s. You know, anybody that worked with engines was, was almost destined, or was good with engines, was destined to be, if not a millionaire, usually pretty wealthy. Um, let's take a look. Uh, as you can see, it just has one single door on this side. You enter from the passenger side. I've got a book here. Uh, it's called The Car That Made Good in the Day Stutz. This is put out by the Stutz uh, Club. It's fantastic history of Harry Stutz and all his cars. And that slogan, The Car That Made Good in the Day, Harry Stutz, when he built his car, he didn't road test it. He didn't take it to the track. He finished the car and he said, let's go race it in Indianapolis. It was either the very first or the second Indianapolis. And he entered the race and he came in 11th, which was pretty good for a car that <laughs> had never been even tested on the road before. So uh, making uh, lemonade out of lemons, he uh, came up with the slogan, the car that made good in the day, meaning it proved itself against out-and-out -out race cars from Europe and the best of America had to offer and his car was a completely stock passenger car and it came in 11th in Indianapolis and that's how he made his reputation. He was one of those boom or bust guys. He was really wealthy, went broke, made some money again, went broke again, uh, you know, eventually died at age 53, I think of a burst appendix, if I'm not mistaken, something like that. But uh, let's get back to the car. As you can see, no brakes in the front. Still a uh, right-hand drive, which a lot of American cars had. Henry Ford is really the guy that fought for the left-hand drive, and eventually everybody switched over because more than half of the cars sold in America were Ford. So it was one of those things like Beta and VHS. I don't know that one was better or worse than the other, but uh, the most popular one usually wins out. And this was the first Stutz to have an engine designed specifically for this car. As I said earlier, Harry Stutz used all, uh, used everybody else's motors with his components, and then he wanted to build his own car with his own engine. And let's take a look at what it looks like. Let's open it up on the intake side. That's where most of the pretty stuff is. Okay, here we go. There it is right there. This is a 16 valve engine. It's a T-head design. You have dual camshafts operating 16 valves. You adjust the valves here. Open those doors there or take that panel off. Uh, three and three-eighths bore, six-inch stroke, giving a displacement of about uh, 361 cubic inches. Uh, the cylinders are cast in a single block of what they call superfine grade uh, gray iron, uh, crankshaft was nickel steel, heat treated, all of that. Uh, camshafts are made out of the same material, bronze bearings. Uh, the crankcase is an aluminum alloy. Uh, the upper half has massive webbing to support the crankshaft rigidity. Push rods are nickel steel, valves are tungsten steel. It holds about 10 quarts, and lubrication was force feed to the crankshaft bearings. Uh, and an oil splash system was pretty effective. This has got a, uh, this has got an oil gauge in it, but it's pretty scary <laughs> because when it gets warm, it doesn't register any oil pressure because it's all splash. Now, a lot of people thought this engine was kind of old-fashioned when it was designed because uh, the overhead valves, especially on racing cars or high-performance cars, that was really the way to go. And Harry Stutz had to depend, uh, defend his decision to have a 16-valve T-head engine. The reason he went with these 16 valves was uh, the smaller size uh, of the valves of, of uh, four valve eliminated the possibility of warping and crystallizing from high speed, and the wear in the cams and the valve mechanism was reduced also. Uh, the valve area, though, was greater and that afforded a longer duration of maximum gas flow and all that kind of thing. So that was his excuse, and that's what they said in all the say, uh, sales catalogs. Now, those of you that are real Stutz guys might notice, this ignition system has been upgraded by only a few years. The normal system that was in here it was okay. We put this uh, from a later car onto this car just because 
it just made it, it just ran a lot better. Uh, you know, ignition technology was moving pretty quickly, and by the 30s, which this is, uh, it, it just works better. It looks period, and it's, it's fine, but it just makes for a better running car. This is your uh, Stromberg carburetor here. Notice it's glass. You can see how much fuel is in there. Here's your intake. These are your uh, primer cups. What you do here, in cold weather, you would open this. You'd put a little gas in here, which would put a little gasoline directly into the cylinder. You'd close this, and then when you cranked it, it would fire off right away because the gas didn't have to pull through the updraft carburetor. The reason they use updraft carburetors was because carburetor technology was still pretty primitive. And the needle, you know how the needle lets the fuel in and out? Well, if you had a downdraft carburetor, I mean, the carburetor's up here and the gas is coming down, and, and the gasoline in the carburetor sat overnight, it could seep past the needle, get into the cylinders, your cylinder would fill with gas, you turn the key, and it can't compress, and you literally hydraulic the cylinder and, and, and blow the block apart. So the way these worked was any residual gas would just fall on the ground, not particularly environmentally correct, but that's the way they did it back in the day. It has electric start. Uh, it has uh, two spark plugs per cylinder. Normally, this would have had a two-bladed fan, airplane type, they called it. Uh, this has a four-blade fan because it's California, it gets pretty hot and you sit in traffic and none of those things existed when this car was built. Uh, it's a complex engine and, you know, as I said, we went through three sets of pistons because everything expands at different rates and you, you go down the road, all of a sudden, tuk, 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 the engine would soft seize, meaning the piston would grow, tighten in the bore, and then it would lock up. As soon as it cooled, you could go again, but by that time, the piston has scored the cylinder, and you've got to hone it or possibly rebore it all over again. So we did that a total of three times. We finally got it right, and, and now it seems to be okay. But that's why I always chuckle when I watch these shows where, come on, guys, let's work all night and restore the car, and the next morning the owner shows up, Ooh, okay. oh, it's painted and all, everything's done on it. Now, I've had this car 20 years, and I would say for the first 10 or 12, it was pretty frustrating. Just, you'd think you got it, and then something would happen again. But now we finally got it where it's a good running, dependable car, and a really sexy car, and a kind of cool car as well. So, uh, well, here's what I think is the sexiest part of this car. I mentioned this before. Notice how the fender is higher than the body. I think that's really kind of cool. Your folding top fits under this cover here. Uh, the spare tire drops into this area here, kind of like an early Continental kit. Uh, this is a period lock that holds your tire in place. You know, your gas tank is back here, and your gas cage is conveniently located here. So whenever you want to know how much gas, you go, just get out, pull off the side of the road, look at that, go around the passenger side, and uh, get back in again. You had one light here. These are all your lubrication points for your springs. You do all of that. You had brakes on the rear only, which, uh, was fine back in the day, you know. Uh, this car costs about $2,500 new, which doesn't sound like a lot today, but uh, a Model T was about $260 to $300. So that was quite a bit of money, but you got a car that was twice as fast, actually twice as fast as the Model T. This was rated about 80 horsepower, and it could go about 85 to 90 miles an hour. Model T was rated at 22 horsepower, I think, and that went about uh, 40 miles an hour, something like that. So this was quite a sporty car. Uh, let's go over the dashboard a little bit just to give you some idea. We have this beautiful wood steering wheel, and you have your, uh, this advance and retard for your ignition, and this is a hand throttle to raise or lower. It even can be used as a raise, or, uh, lower the idle, rather. This could be used as a as a uh, speed control too, just set it and forget it, I guess. Uh, there you have your oil pressure gauge over there, although you don't have, you have oil pressure when you start out at about 30 pounds, and then as the oil gets warm, as I said, it just throws it around, it goes to zero, which is scary, so most people opted not to get the oil pressure gauge. That's your air meter, these are your headlights, and all your uh, headlights, side lights, all that tail light. Uh, this is a uh, magneto. That's a, well, that's a battery, that's a magneto. Uh, this is an air pump. The way this works is early cars like this did not have a mechanical fuel pump or electric fuel pump. What you did was you loosened this, you, you pumped it up, 
and see you got pressure on this gauge here, about two pounds, then you would lock it in and the air would force the gasoline through the car. And they were pretty bulletproof, you know, there's no need for a mechanical uh, fuel pump or electric fuel pump when you had that. Then you had your speedometer and tripometer over there. Your windshield, you'd loosen these and you could open the windshield like this completely if you just wanted the wind in your face, which is kind of cool on a summer's day. And then you tighten it up again. You had a spotlight here. And then outside here, you had, well, let me show you first of all on the floor. First you had this, which is kind of cool. This is your exhaust cutout. This would, right now it's going through the muffler. When you got on the outskirts of town, you want to open it up a little bit, you press that down and you slide it over, as I'll, do, I'll show you later. And now you got a straight through exhaust, which is loud and noisy and gives you a couple more horsepower. Uh, you had the drop floor, just like the Indianapolis Racers had. You had a center throttle, like the Indianapolis Racers had. That's your clutch and that's your brake. This is the, the light for your uh, spotlight here. Uh, outside the car, which is kind of cool, which was a really racy feature back in the day, you had the outside gear shift, just like the old race cars from the period, and you had, had your handbrake out here as well. And your battery went in this box right here. I think it's time to take this baby for a ride. the English would describe as a CADS car. You know, if you were sort of a swinging single guy in 1918, this would be the car that I think women probably would have been attracted to. Really sporty, you know, kind of go to the football games in the raccoon coat and the whole deal. You got out of town, you could open the exhaust, make a little noise. about the edge because it had a four-speed box. It was a bit more of a real racing car. And as I said before, this windshield opens and closes if you want to get more air through here. Yeah, Harry Stutz was an interesting guy. He built some beautiful cars. A very religious guy. Not a big player. Died fairly young. Kind of a sad story, but one of the American greats, a real original. Grew up in Asonia, Asonia, Ohio. I think that's how you say it, I'm not sure. Married to the same woman as, no, no, he didn't, no, he had an affair, that's right. That, forget that whole thing, forget what I said. <laughs> my motor meter is right in front of me so I can see my temperature. The motor meter is at, uh, emblem that sits on top of the radiator. It has a thermometer in it, and the thermometer tells you what your temperature is. 
and right now we're not even halfway up the scale so it's about 80 degrees today here in California and this thing is running nice and cool. I run Evans Cool in these old motors, these non-pressurized ones, because there's no water in it. Evans Cool is a life of the car coolant. You put it in, you never have to put any more in again, unless of course you have a leak of some kind. But it boils at 370, so it's not gonna shoot out over you. And a reasonably comfortable car as well, as I said. This is probably Stutz's most successful car, and certainly the car he's most remembered for. But for an almost 100-year-old car, you can drive it like a regular car and just cruise around. On a summer night in California, go along the Pacific Coast Highway. It's not really a, a freeway car. You don't want to be on the 405 trying to keep up with 80, 90 mile an hour traffic. But on a nice two lane road like this, boy, it doesn't get any better. This bridge I'm going over, if you ever saw the movie Chinatown with Jack Nicholson, this is the bridge where a lot of the action took place. Kind of cool. I only mention it because this car fits right in with that period. <laughs> Let's go, girls, pick it up. Come on, girls, pick it up. Let's go, let's go. <laughs> Although these cars aren't fast by modern standards, just the sheer mechanicalness of them makes them fun to drive. There's no electrics in this car other than the, the lights and the battery. You know, I mean, the brakes are mechanical, <laughs> the, the gear shifts mechanical, everything's mechanical on it. It's, it's just kind of fun. And that exhaust cut out. You know, there aren't a lot of modern cars that are fun that are fun at 45 miles an hour. That's my, what makes these so much fun. You know, this car is geared to be between 45 and 60. So consequently, everything's running optimally at that RPM. You know, these brakes, you don't want to slam them on at 70 because nothing will happen. So 45, you cruise along, wind in your face, beautiful California day. You can even open this windshield if you want. Let's open that exhaust cutout again. I hope this uh, third time's a charm thing we did here. Um, as I said, I had this car 20 years. I got terribly discouraged by it because it was, everything was just off, you know? The transaxle wouldn't shift right. The engine kept seizing. But you take your time. Like I said before, you, it's the kind of project you work on it. The engine seizes, you put it away for six months. You work on something else, you come back and you give it a shot. So. Like I say, I always smile when I see these shows where people restore a car over a weekend because they're up all night. <laughs> it doesn't really work that way. But uh, it's turned out to be just a wonderful car, just a great touring car, a car to go on a, a drive with. It's sporty, it's sexy. Uh, it, it really is of the era, you know, that era in the late teens, the beginning of the roaring 20s. This is what uh, all the cool guys had. So it's, uh, it's fun to share a piece of this history with you. And the reason I haven't shut it off is I, I want to go put another 50 or 100 miles on it. So uh, we'll see you guys later. Bye-bye.